the person that I could be Awakening my heart, breaking through the dark Suddenly your grace Like sunlight burning at midnight Making my life something so beautiful, beautiful Mercy reaching to save me All that I need, you are so beautiful, beautiful joy inside I can't contain but even perfect days can end in rain and though it's pouring down I see you through the clouds shining on my So beautiful, beautiful, mercy reaching to save me All that I need, you are so beautiful, beautiful I have come undone, but I have just begun Changing by your Thank you. And it was nice to see our band had a full complement of guitars today. That was nice, wasn't it? So we've been talking about Balaam and Balak. Remember, Balak is the king of the Moabites, and Balaam was the prophet who was sometimes a prophet of God. And the question that we have to ask about Balak is what was his end game? What did he really want? And he told us last week, he said what he really wanted was for Balaam to come and use his pull with God to curse this people so that they would be weak enough <clears throat> that Balak could then attack them and conquer them. You know, sometimes I think we fail to look at the end game. Wisdom is acting in one's long-term best interest at all times. And sometimes we do things that I wonder if we've thought about the end game. The current administration blames the last administration for going into Iraq without an end game in mind. And that may be true, but now this administration is facing the same problem in Syria, aren't they? And they've got to decide what they're gonna do about their end game of how they want to handle Syria. And sometimes, as a, as a lawyer, I saw a lot of people in marriages fighting. And they'd have argument after argument after argument. And the question is, when they started the argument, did they have an end game in mind? Sometimes you provoke something or you start something because of something that you're feeling and you start saying something without an eye toward where saying that is going to end. Is there any way that some of these marital arguments can end that's better for everybody, that's in everybody's long-term best interest? And the answer is mostly no. We've got to think about the end game. Here's the end game that Balak really wanted. He wanted Balaam to stand up over the people of Israel and say, may your crops fail, may your children be stillborn, may, your, uh, may the, the food that you have be moldy and eaten by rats, May you have hemorrhoids. That's what he would have said. You see, that's, that's the way God cursed some people, isn't it? God cursed some people with famine. 
He cursed some people with sores. He cursed some people with hunger. He cursed some people with fights and illnesses. So that's the way God sometimes dealt with people. And that's exactly what Balak wanted Balaam to do. We're in chapter uh, 23 of Numbers. And in 23, chapter 23 of Numbers, it begins by saying, Then Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here and prepare for me seven bulls and seven rams. Now, remember they were standing on a mountain overlooking the encampment of Israel. And this is exactly the view that had scared Balak bad enough to call Balaam in the first place. He said, man, these people look too, too strong. They look too many for me. Come and curse them so that I can defeat them. Then Balaam said to Balak, stand by your burnt offering and I will go. And by the way, seven bulls and seven rams is not an offering prescribed by God for the Israelites for anything. This is an unusual offering and it's an offering that, Baal off, uh, that Balaam offered without God's seal of approval. So this is just an offering that came up out of his head and he offered this and it said, you stand by your burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height and God met Balaam and said to him, I have prepared the seven altars. And he said to him, I have prepared the seven altars and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. How do you think that worked? I've always had a picture of a shoehorn or a tongue depressor. You getting that picture? God put a word into his mouth and he said, return to Balak and thus shall you speak. So he returned to him and there he was standing by his burnt offering and all the princes of Moab and he took up his oracle. Now that word oracle in the Hebrew doesn't mean what it means in the Matrix movies. Um, the oracle means his speech, his prophetic utterance. That's all it means. It's his, his prose or his poetry. And in this case, it's poetry. So he takes up his oracle and he says, Balak the king of Moab has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For the top of the rocks I see him. And from the hills I behold him. There, a people dwelling alone and not reckoning itself among the nations. Ellen White says that looking over this orderly but vast assembly was awe-inspiring. Nobody had ever come into a land with this kind of precision and order and hygiene and, and, and health and vigor and prosperity. This was not your normal convocation or camping trip. This was up to as many as two million people who had been groomed by God for 40 years in the wilderness and they were ready to take their place in Canaan. And it was a beautiful sight, an awe-inspiring sight. It would make a mortal shiver to see God's order put on humankind in that way. And it did because he said, from the tops of the rocks I see him, a people dwelling alone not reckoning themselves among the nations. In other words, different, better than the people around them. And then he says something really interesting. He says, who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Well, clearly they could count them because soon thereafter they had a census and they did count them. So he was either speaking hyperbole or rhetorically, which they did a lot in the Old Testament, didn't they? They said, oh, too many, too many, too many. And they, and they say that. Do you, do you know anybody that speaks like that? Um, this is the best cookie I have ever had in my whole life, right? This is the best day I've ever had in my life. This dress is the prettiest dress I've ever seen in my life. This car is faster than any car I've ever driven in my life, right? We say those sorts of things, and that's hyperbole, isn't it? It's rhetoric. It's a thing that we say to make a point. It's not statistically or scientifically accurate, but it is, it is an expression that conveys a meaning of, of extraordinariness, right? So the question is, was Balaam speaking hyperbolically, rhetorically, or is it possible that he was speaking prophetically? Who can count the dust of Jacob or number a fourth of Israel? 
Galatians chapter 3 verse 7 says, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Paul here is announcing a sea change. He says, up until now, you have counted sons of Abraham by genealogy. And I'm telling you there's a different way to count. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you are all the nations to be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Verse 26, for you are all sons of God through the faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So here he's not talking hyperbolic. He's not talking rhetorically. He's saying, look, who can count the dust of Jacob or a quarter of Israel? Because in the future, the, the universe will be populated by spiritual Israel. And they'll be unable to count them. And then he goes on to say, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Really? Because he was talking about Jacob Israel, right? And Jacob died and his bones were still with him, weren't, weren't they? So that's not the person he was talking about dying like. He was talking about a future descendant. He was talking about the nation of Israel. He was talking about everlasting life. He said, let me die the life, the death of the righteous and let me, my end, the time after his death, be like his. In other words, this is prophetic of the end time events. This is prophetic of the second coming. So Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies and look, you've blessed them bountifully. Look at the, look at the words, they're, old, they're, they're, they're past tense, aren't they? He didn't say you're blessing them, you've pronounced a future blessing on them. He said you, past tense, blessed them bountifully. So the words of blessing has been spoken, the blessing was already given. He said you have blessed them bountifully bountifully. And so he answered and said, must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? So what's a blessing? The dictionary says that a blessing is to invoke God's favor. It also says that it's to bestow happiness, good things, or to make holy or to extol. And how do we give blessings today? There are a lot of different ways. We're talking today mostly about how to give blessings in word, but there are also blessings in deed, aren't there? A touch can be a blessing, can't it? Has anybody here ever been blessed by a touch, a hug, or a kiss, or a caress, or some hand on the shoulder? But you know, we live in a culture that is full of stuff. We are a stuff-dominated culture, aren't we? Everything, you get guys together, what are they gonna do? They're gonna talk about their stuff. Hey, I got the new, uh, you know, QX1100. And you don't know if he's talking about a cordless drill, a laptop computer, a car, or a new pen. You just can't tell. He says, I got the QX1100 and it really is worth the money. Could be a cell phone too. You never know. The QX1100 will do everything it's advertised to do and more. We talk about our stuff a lot, don't we guys? So the question is, we live in a society of stuff. Maybe one of the ways that we could bless each other is with stuff. Have you ever noticed that people get together and have garage sales to get rid of unwanted stuff? I've wondered what it would be like if instead of having a garage sale, if you got your unwanted stuff together and put name tags on them. I think Bill would like this. I think Sue would like that. I think Jeremy would like this. And, and, and then you call them up and say, hey, could you use an extra cordless drill? I remember the time, I've told you the story before of my father using the, the drill to put together this furniture that I thought I was going to have to use a hand screwdriver on. And at the end of that project, I said, man, that really made that job easy. And he said, well, I've got lots of those drills. You can keep that one. I was so blessed that he would think enough of me that he would just give me a drill that he had used. And you know, I always coveted his uh, apron belt 
Have you ever seen these guys that are carpenters and they have an apron belt and it is just perfect? It holds absolutely everything. Boy, I've always coveted that. You know, if somebody blessed me with one of those belts, that'd be kind of cool too, wouldn't it, right? Well, what if we blessed each other with the stuff that we're no longer using? What if we blessed each other just to let people know that we were thinking about them, that we cared about them, and it wouldn't matter if they threw it away because we were going to throw it away anyway, weren't we? What if we started giving stuff to one another? Not new stuff, used stuff. Wouldn't that be a blessing? The real question is, what about our used up words? What, are we, what words are we giving to each other in blessing? And that's what this text is about. Second prophecy. So the next thing that happens is Balak says to Balaam, look, maybe the view, maybe the overview of Israel was too much for you. Maybe they were too beautiful in their completeness. Maybe their, their, their rows of camping tents were, were too straight. Maybe their hygiene was too good. Maybe their animals looked too healthy. Let me try something different. Let me take you to the edge of the camp. Let me take you to where the stragglers hang out. And it says this, please come with me to another place which you may see them. You will see only the outer part of them. And that word outer part in Hebrew means the, the fringe or the stragglers. Let me take you to where the stragglers are. So he brought him to a field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah. And he built seven altars and, altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And he said to Balak, stand here by your burnt offering while I meet the Lord over there. And so he, the Lord met Balaam and he put a word in his mouth again. I don't know if he used the dung depressor or not. And then go back to Balak and thus you shall, shall speak. And so he came back to him and there he was standing by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab were with him. And Balak said, what has the Lord spoken? Now, I, I don't know, you know, I, I, that's a kind of a dangerous question. It, was he just a slow learner? You know, he had just told him, how can I curse what God has blessed? But he says, go try again. Now, what has he told you? And he comes back and he says, he took up his oracle, he took up his poem and he said, rise up Balak and hear, listen to me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie. In other words, why are you asking me the same question again? Are you thinking that I'm a God who changes? He said, think again, nor a son of man that he should repent. He has said, and will he not do? He has spoken, will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. And in Hebrew, it's even more cryptic. He, Balaam is saying, I have gotten and I will give a blessing. That's all he can do. He says, I have gotten and I will give. He says, he has blessed and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. Now, wait a minute. He has not seen wickedness or iniquity in Jacob or Israel. Wait a minute. That's not right, is it? Look at the history. 40 years in the wilderness, what was that for? Iniquity, right? Wickedness, absolutely. How many were lost in the, in the field for 40 years? Maybe as many as 2 million people were lost. Why were they lost? Iniquity, wickedness. And it says here, I, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. This could be hyperbole, or it could be prophecy. See, he's talking about Israel's future, where their sin will be blotted out. He says, the Lord, his God, is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox, for there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. Look, a people rises like a lioness and lifts itself up like a lion, and it shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. It's talking about the second coming, isn't it? He's talking about a lion of Judah that's going to come up and make everything right and make Israel victorious again. And then Balak said to Balaam, neither curse them at all nor bless them. What is he saying? He's saying, I brought you here. I asked you to curse them. At least, at least don't bless them. If you're not, not going to curse them, don't curse them, but at least don't bless them. And he said, I can do nothing but what the Lord speaks. Now, there's a lot of history in the Bible about blessing, but it starts in Genesis. Now, I don't know what you think about the first six days of creation. But the first day of creation, the second day of creation, third day, he took stuff and he manipulated it, right? 
Somehow I think that's a sort of a blessing. You know, I don't like to eat flour. You like to eat flour? It's kind of dry, flavorless, right? I don't even really like to eat sugar very much because it's just kind of flavorless and excessively sweet, right? And I certainly don't like to drink vegetable oil, not my favorite thing. However, Mary Ellen has ways of putting those together, and I like them very much. And the question, of course, is, what are we doing there? Are we blessing those things to make them more useful? My father was a wood sculptor, and he would take chunks of unrecognizable wood, and he would make beautiful things out of them. Is he blessing the wood? Is he blessing us through the wood? And that's what happened in the first six days of creation. God took a void, and he blessed it until it became useful for people. Now, let me ask you another question. Do you remember what the first blessing in the Bible is? It's in Genesis 1.28, if you want to look at it. The very first verbal blessing of words in the Bible says, verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The very first blessing of God is a blessing on you and me. And don't you think we're blessed to be made in his image? That's a blessing all by itself, isn't it? So he blessed us by making us in his image, and then he pronounced a blessing and told us, be strong, rule the world. And the second blessing, you remember that one, don't you? Chapter 2, verse 3. And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested from all his work which he had created and made. So the first two blessings, he blessed man and woman, and he blessed the seventh day. And then later he said, listen, I made the seventh day for man, not man for the seventh day, didn't he? So he blessed it. And what does that mean? What, what, what kind of blessing does that make? We don't know. We don't know exactly how that blessing works out through history. But we know that it's a blessing that we can enjoy when? Today, right here, right now. So the next big blessing in the Bible is this Jacob thing. Have you heard it? It's in Genesis chapter 27, verse 28. From the dew of heaven and the richness of earth, may God always give you abundant harvests of grain and bountiful new wine. May the nations become your servants and may they bow down to you. May you be the master over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you and all who curse you will be cursed. And all those who bless you will be blessed. Do you all believe in blessings and cursings? We live in a society that only believes in cursings. We live in a society that does a lot of cursing. Open any book, watch any TV show, listen to the radio even, and you hear blankety, blank, 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 right? People curse each other unlimited. They curse all the time. You hear it on every television. You can hardly watch a show. What's the ultimate curse? When I was a kid, kind of the ultimate curse was go to, right? And that's a biblical curse, isn't it? And then the one that is on all the lips today is God, right? And it's saying, no, you can't go to heaven. You're to be damned. And that is a strong curse. It's the strongest curse that anyone can make. And yet it trips off the tongue on every television show. It's in all the books that you read, in all the novels. It's everywhere. It's, it's curses. And we all curse people. Has anybody here got a scar from a curse word? Anybody here ever been cursed by somebody, maybe even that you love? Somebody said, man, that kid is just stupid. Has anybody got a scar from that? Anybody here ever been scarred by somebody else's curse, by somebody else's words? Has anybody here ever been scarred maybe even by a word that a parent might have said accidentally or maybe not so accidentally? Have you been scarred by your best friend's words, your spouse's words, your children's words? See, we like to pretend that words don't have power, but words do have power. They have the power to curse, and they have the power to bless. You know, there's a, there's a little thing I read about uh, what you should and shouldn't say to the police officer when he pulls you over. 
If you don't think words matter, try this on. Officer, I can't read my driver's license unless you hold my beer. That'd probably be the wrong thing to say, don't you think? Or, officer, you're not going to look in the trunk, are you? Or, I thought you had to be in relatively good physical condition to be an officer of the law. <laughs> probably not the right thing to say. Or, when he asks you if your eyes are red, have you been drinking? Say, your eyes look glazed. Have you been eating donuts? <laughs> so these are things you might not want to say. And you can say that words don't matter, but they really do, don't they? We can say words that can absolutely scar and cripple the ones that we love. Or we can say words that will build them up. Then Balak said to Balaam, please come and I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them there for me. So Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor that overlooks the wasteland. And Balaam said to Balak, build for me seven altars and prepare the seven bulls and seven rams. And he did as he said, and he offered a bull and ram on every, offer, and on every altar. Now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord God to bless, he did not go as the other times to use his sorcery. But he set his face toward the wilderness and Balaam raised his eyes, and he saw Israel encamped according to their tribes. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And he took up his speech and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of a man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. What's he describing? He's driving, it's describing a trance, right? He says, The one who God has put into a trance and revealed to. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob! Your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside waters. He shall pour water from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag. Uh-oh, we're getting into prophecy again, aren't we? His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones. He'll pierce them with his arrows. His bows, he bows down. He lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. Wow. He's into prophecy. He's into blessings. And the question is, are you into prophecies and blessing? You know what Balak said? Balak said, look, I'm done with you. I called you to do a job. You won't do the job. You did the absolute opposite of the job. Now here's what I'm going to tell you. You best get back to where you came from before things go badly here for you. And he's chased him off. And they both went back to their own places. But right before he left, he said, wait, I've got one more. He said, and he talks about being the one who is in a vision again. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult. And Edom shall be a possession and Seir also his enemies shall be a possession while Israel does valiantly. And out of Jacob, one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. Perfectly prophetic, isn't it? He talking, he's talking here about the Messiah. And so the question is, we have power and blessing and power and cursing, and, and sometimes we don't think about this. You know, Winston Churchill once said uh, about one of his opponents, he said, uh, occasionally he stumbles over the truth, but he picks himself up and goes on and forgets about it. There is a truth today that I want you to take with you, and that truth is that blessings and cursings matter. Your words matter. The words that we say about our people and our friends and our people here in the church matter. When you go home from church here and say, did you see what he was wearing? That is not acceptable. That is unacceptable Christian behavior. I hate to be tough about it, but that's really what it is. To go home from here and say, man, that guy really stank. That's unacceptable Christian behavior. Can you believe the stupid comment he made in Sabbath school? Absolutely unacceptable. We are not to curse who God has blessed. And these people in this room, 
God has blessed. And you are not to use your words against these people in this room. Period. Full stop. End of story. Now the question is, what in the world are we supposed to do to bless one another? You know, there are a couple of examples in the New Testament. Mark 10, 15, perhaps you've seen it. Mark 10, 15 is where Jesus was having the people come to him. It starts in 13. Then they brought the little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. And he said to them, Let the children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and he laid his hands upon them and he blessed them. Now the question I have is, does somebody want to be my guinea pig today? Does somebody want to be blessed? Do you want to come up and I'll bless you? Come on. Come on. Hello. 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 Okay, when we're going to bless somebody, what's your name? Jorge. Jorge, just like your dad? Yep. <laughs> okay. When you're going to bless somebody, the Bible says that a meaningful touch is important. Jesus laid his hands on people, didn't he? He always touched them. In fact, he always touched people when he blessed them. So we're to have a meaningful touch. In fact, there's an interesting story. When Isaac was going to bless Jacob, what did he say? Come here close and kiss me first. I'm not going to kiss you. Is that all right? Yes. Okay. He said, come here close and kiss me and then I can bless you. There had to be a touch involved, isn't it? Now, I don't, I'm not saying this is magical, and I think you can bless people over the telephone, okay? I really do. I think you can bless people with a letter. I think you can bless people with a prayer, even when they don't even know they're being blessed. But I want to tell you that if you want to bless in the biblical way, the way Jesus blessed and the way his, his, uh, his, his minions blessed before him, there's a touch involved. Jorge, I'm touching you. Is that all right with you? Uh, yes. Good. <laughs> The next thing that we do is that we give our full attention to somebody. You remember that story of the woman who had the issue of blood? She tried to get healed without getting attention. And that's not the way it works, is it? As soon as Jesus knew that she was approaching him for healing, and in fact had already received it, the, he stopped the prey, didn't he? He put a full screeching halt on everything that was going. He was going to the chief priest's house or the, the, the head of the synagogue's house, wasn't he? He was going to help Jairus' child. And he was on the road. And there was a parade and a procession. And he stopped all of it. He said, no. Even though that child is about to die, this is important. He says, I'm going to turn back and I'm going to give this woman my full attention. So he gave her his full attention. He looked her right in the eye. And he said, Jorge, may God bless you. May he give you prosperity and health and joy for all of your life. Amen. Amen. And he gives him words. I'm not letting you go. He gives words, but the words come out of a vision. A vision of a future, a glorious future. And that future can be all the way into eternity. But the words have to come out of a vision of a future. They're not just words that come out of thin air, right? It's words that come out of a vision of a future. And we speak those words, and if we speak them from the Scripture, it's even better. We speak the Scripture, and we speak the words of blessing out of a future. And there's one last thing, and that's why I didn't let go of you, Jorge. The last thing that we have to do is that we have to follow up on it. Now, when Isaac blessed Jacob... He didn't really have much time to follow up. He died. But when God blesses us, he follows up, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He follows up and he keeps track of us. So now it's my job because I've blessed Jorge to keep track of Jorge. <laughs> and I've got to be keeping my eye on Jorge. And I've got to make sure that I am doing my part to make sure that God's blessing is sure in his life. Right? So can we re refresh? And now I'll let you go just for now. Okay? okay? Thank you, Jorge. So the steps are these. Number one, number one, we have to approach and touch if we can. 
Number two, we need to envision a glorious future. Number three, we need to give words that are words of prophecy and blessing and eternity and goodness. And four, we need to follow up with them, don't we? We need to give them our full attention while doing this. We can bless each other the way Jesus blessed. He has given us the authority. He says, what you bind on heaven, not what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And the question is, how are you using your mouth today? Are you blessing or are you cursing? You are not called to curse. You are called to bless. So today I call you, I adjure you in the name of the living God that you use your mouth that God gave you and that he made in his own image to bless and not to curse. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we have often been wrong in this. We have often cursed with our mouth and we've cursed in our mind and we've even sometimes cursed in prayer. We have cursed at lunch after Sabbath. We've cursed in this very building. We've cursed our family members and we've cursed our loved ones and we've cursed those that we don't care about. And we ask that you'd change that for us today. Plant your Holy Spirit in us and control our tongue. Please give our tongues continual blessing. We bless you for who you are and we ask that you would help us to bless others. Not just here and not just now, not just in this room, but everywhere we go. We wish that you would pronounce a blessing and we trust you to pronounce a blessing through us on our children. To pronounce a blessing through us on our neighbors. To pronounce a blessing through us on this church and every member in it. Father, please bless every person in this room with prosperity, with activity, with joy, with long life, and with successful ministry to grow your kingdom. Because we know that this is what you've called each of us to, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name.